I have a question here. The question goes, do you think Paramahansa Yogananda or Osho was enlightened? What do you think about that? Osho, of course, used to be known as Bhagwan Rashnish, right? And Paramahansa Yogananda also changed his name. Uh, so, what do I think about these two people? Do I think they were enlightened? Well, whether they were enlightened, I don't know. It depends what you mean when you say enlightened. But enlightenment is really a topic that is not really that open for discussion. It's quite abstract. It's going to be very difficult to see into somebody else's heart and mind what they are feeling, what is their perceptions, what is their state of mind. You can only make your assessment uh, from your subjective experience when you meet someone by assessing, analyzing their persona, their public personality. Also you can you can analyze what they have done in their life. That's not a criteria of enlightenment. But I think a better question would be who do I think they were? What kind of impact did they have on people? Both of these people had quite a big impact on their followers. They both were from India. They both settled in the West, in the United States. Osho did not settle eventually in the United States because uh, there were some tragic things that happened in his compound. Uh, very controversial things. He seemed to have left decisions to some of his the disciples and they made some pretty bad decisions and that reflected on him that reflected on his judgment that reflected on his uh, humanity his human nature there's some I, I knew about Osho for years and I read his books and I was very interested in him and one day I saw the photo the mugshot that was taken of him when he was arrested and they used to observe him in the jail and they were saying he was pretty restless in the jail and uh, it seemed like to them he was just another human being. Of course, take back some, take away somebody's followers, take away his Rolls Royces, take away all his uh, followers, put a man alone in the jail cell. It changes the perspective of who he is. Um, but nevertheless, he obviously had a very large personality and, a, and an aura about him. He had a powerful effect on his followers. It comes to Yogananda, Yogananda as well. Yogananda had a very um, a large following. He settled in the West somewhere and he had a huge following, still has a huge following in California. Founded Self-Realization Fellowship. Now, Yogananda was more idealistic than Osho. Osho was not an idealist. Osho was quite against uh, traditional, uh, the traditional religions, the traditional Indian view of uh, a pious guru. So, many of the things he did, you don't know if he did it in order to contradict the traditional view of a pious guru or if he did it because he wanted those things. Did he want the Rolls Royces? Did he want all those women? His closest disciple, uh, one of his closest people, Sheila, she said that Osho was more interested in where he was going to get his next Rolls Royce from than from what the disciples wanted. They used to write letters to him, ask him, Ooh, I saw this light, I saw magenta light when I was meditating. Does this mean I'm on my way to enlightenment? So they asked Osho, what should we respond to them? And he said, just tell them, follow your heart, follow your heart. But Yogananda was, uh, of course, way before Osho. And um, Yogananda was a celibate monk. 
I don't know if there are any stories of Yogananda having uh, relationships with disciples. I, I doubt that. I, I presume he was pretty sincere about his celibacy. It's very important to him. But Osho not. Osho used to brag about all the women he had. Osho was definitely not... Um, uh, he, he could be like just a, a show. It could have been like a Hugh Hefner show. But I, I think uh, for Osho it was important to advocate and to preach freedom. He said freedom was the most important value that there is. So what's the difference between these two? Well, uh, quite, a, quite a large difference. It would be difficult to say that they both were in the same state of mind. If you had to say enlightenment is a state of mind. But maybe it was so. Maybe enlightenment doesn't have anything to do with the direct behavior of a person. But an important factor though is when you deal with this kind of thing is obviously for, for people who um, believe that they're not enlightened it would be um, how, how you have to make a judgment you cannot just follow your heart that's how many people are conned into cults by following their heart there has to be some very strong discernment that you use when dealing with these kind of situations and these kind of people so you could analyze the psychology of some of these gurus what did they want from life nobody would be in this world if they did not want something and if you're surrounded by people if you draw many people to you the question is then what do you want from people Obviously, if you did not want anything from people, you could just avoid them altogether. So, what do you want from people? And that's where the psychology comes to play. They need their master, but he needs them too. But what does he need from them? So, what people need from each other could be many things. For instance, obviously, if a leader of a group, a cult, or a religion, your religious uh, group, uh, has a lot of women, if he has concubines, if he's having sexual relationships with his uh, followers, obviously he needs sex. He needs sex. If he gets a lot of m money from them, a lot of material goods, Rolls Royces and stuff, he needs money. He needs stuff. So, sometimes, like in Yogananda's case, he did not accumulate material goods. So he needed the money to build his organization. He was very idealistic about his organization, about the enlightenment that he wanted to bring to the world. So that was, whenever somebody has an ideal about themselves, in psychology it amounts or translates into a gimmick. A gimmick is a belief you have about how you should relate to people, specific people. And any gimmick that you have, you could be trapped. Because when people sense your gimmick, they can withhold it from you. And that causes conflict. That causes a weird scenario where a man could um, be upset by a beggar in the street. The beggar could say something to him that could spoil his whole day and could haunt him and scratch his brain for a long time. And somebody would say, but he's just a beggar, there's nobody, he's an insignificant person. How could his words disturb you so much? Well, it's because this insignificant person picked up on the gimmick the man has about himself. It's like, ooh, you're such a successful, handsome man, right? So, uh, when it comes to gurus, uh, I think it, it's difficult to pick up a gimmick in Osho uh, because Osho it seemed pretty simple. He wanted uh, Rolls Royces and he wanted women, right? But uh, what he wanted psychologically f f from his followers, that's a different issue. Yogananda wanted to... He wanted to, he was very idealistic about India and the value that 
India and Indian philosophy had for the world. So he's, he's, he's kind of a gimmicks and his ego was attached to the practice of yoga. And if someone devalued that, it might have upset him. So someone like uh, moving to someone like Krishna Murti. Krishna Murti towards the later part of his life especially experienced a lot of frustration. He felt, it seemed clear that he felt people did not understand him. And his gimmick was, people have to understand me. I have to make people understand me. Which very rarely happened. If you saw interviews with Krishnamurti, Krishnamurti and, um, and discussions, it is very seldom that he told someone, yes, you, you, you got that, that's exactly what I meant. He usually told them, no, 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 no. You don't get it, dude, you don't get it. So, uh, yeah, so who, who were these people? And they were just, they were in the end, uh, they were um, human. They were uh, fallible, they made mistakes. But there's another uh, issue is uh, what, what they left behind. That's another way you could assess who they were. Who did they leave behind? What did they leave behind? Did they leave any followers behind that were quite advanced spiritually? Is there anyone that Osho left behind that made such a big splash in the world? Or did he leave behind a lot of confused people? That's another issue. If you find an instructor of a martial art, if you are going to do karate and you train with an instructor for five years, for ten years, and after five or ten years you still are only capable of doing the basic movements or you're confused about how we, what you should do, you're confused about the basics of the practice, it means them the instructor did not do his job. A good teacher will have students that have advanced and some of his students in most cases might advance further than him. So if the guru left behind a mass of confused people and none of them had a presence such as um, he had, that should say something too. See, it could simply mean the person had a huge personality and didn't actually have anything valuable to teach apart from just um, his own personality in the world. So if you have any questions, you want to discuss any topic, anything from philosophy, psychology, to um, metaphysical, uh, esoteric subjects, let me know. We can discuss those questions. I'll see you later.